let's uh, move on to the next one. The biggest fumble of the year, we're covering some of these already, but we get a little bit more specific. Uh, the biggest fumble of the year. <laughs> well, it, it's funny, there, there have been a few, and I've been very interested in, in seeing which one sticks. There are a lot of gaffes. Uh, the one that comes to most people's minds, I would assume, would be infidel atheists. <laughs> Strange comment from Brian Pallister, and just you watch him in question period, he, he's got sort of a, he has a point, and he's a joke, and the line between the two are not, it is not straight. So, so sometimes he'll start off quoting, you know, lyrics from Otis Redding, and then get around to the point, and, and so he was caught in this uh, cute attempt at humor in the hallway, well, I'm going to save that for the behind-the-scenes uh, story. Um, anyway, that, that was probably the biggest fumble that caught on. Interestingly, uh, there were other statements that I would argue are, were equally or more egregious that faded, and it's been reduced to do-good white people, mm -hmm. but it was ignorance of do-good white people. Uh, we had a cabinet minister say that do-good white people are essentially ignorant again, based on this a uh, questionable fundraiser for a women's shelter. It got a fair bit of attention. There was a half-hearted apology that uh, during the scrum was revealed to be uh, a quarter-hearted apology at best. And that, that died. And the infidel atheist, I think just because of its weirdness, <laughs> lived on. Uh, so that's my vote. <laughs> I've been true to his speeches. Well, you know, I, I, I still look at the polling and, and see how inefficient the, conserv the progressive conservative vote is in Manitoba um, and Winnipeg and Battleground Winnipeg and, and how, there's, how, how it's still competitive in Winnipeg between the New Democrats and the progressive conservatives. And, and I realize we're two years out, so part of me says that's still a bit of a fumble on, on, on the progressive conservative side without being able to, to remind people again of what, what I consider to be a, a, a fairly, fairly big error that, uh, that the government made in, in the previous budget. Um, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff uh, again gets you a couple of news cycles, um, but I'm looking at the big fumbles that that set the seeds for a campaign two years later. And so I would still say the, the, the fumble is, is the progressive conservatives not being able to, to seal the deal on, on the PST. They're still on the football field. Um, but I also think that the government hasn't really done a good job of convincing me that, that all this money needs to go to infrastructure. So they're kind of, you know, they're, they're playing with the ball. No, you take it, I take it, you take it, you take it. Um, you know, the other stuff is, yeah, you know, it's, it's inside the park stuff, but when you talk to people on the streets and you talk to them about provincial government and, and politics, they're still talking about, and, and I still can't believe this, they're still talking about the PSD. It's still part of the conversation uh, this time later. Uh... I, my instinct, I mean, it's kind of a hard question to answer, answer because my instinct would be to say the Melnick affair, but I'm not quite sure who screwed up more on that on that file, if the party itself actually did. Um, Melnick fairly clearly fumbled that one, um, but, and, and, and I think Selinger did too, yeah, so I was kind of actually expecting Steve to say Selinger. Um, I, I think the rollout and the messaging of the PST was clearly a shit show, as Teresa would say, um, and and I, and but not just the messaging, potentially the, the decision to do it. I think there are genuine policy pros and cons you could raise there, but the messaging was terrible. But it's actually something that Steve said that reminded me of what I think might be the, the most interesting fumble, or maybe missed opportunity is a better uh, way to term it, and that is the bullying bill, and that might be it might be a session too late. It's like last session, but. But I think um, the, the Tories missed a great opportunity to appeal to Winnipeg in that, and just by saying, we love the gays, we are totally in favor of all, you know, like, 
LGBT anything. We, we're, we're good with that. We are not the party of Steinbach anymore. We are a big tent party. We appeal to urban voters. We have a handsome, you know, urbane leader. Well, they had one before, too, and that didn't help them very much. But whatever. Maybe it helps this time. Um, so, so they really missed an opportunity to be on the right side of that issue. And at the same time, the NDP, I think, really missed an opportunity, a genuine opportunity, to paint Pallister as a 1990s conservative. Um, they didn't come out swinging on that issue. And I kept asking the, the NDP, like, why don't you just get, like, unleash Nancy Allen? Like, just get Nancy Allen to go ballistic on this issue, because she will, and she's tough, and she's aggressive, and she would just tear them a new one. But, but they didn't. Um, they sort of namby pambied around it. Well, it's, you know, it's, uh, they, they just, they didn't confront that issue head on and use it as an opportunity to create a genuine wedge between them and the, and the Tories. And I, and to really paint the Tories as just a rural party. And I never understood why that is. And I, I still don't. So maybe that's my fumble. I'll look at somebody in the crowd and make this statement. And I will just glance at that person. Is this because, because it's an excellent observation, Mary Agnes, is this because Michael Balagas is no longer doing day-to-day -day stuff here in Manitoba? Because if that were to happen, now I'm just gonna kinda glance across the room and I'll see if that person just kinda gives me a wink or a nudge. Is that because Balagas isn't here? <laughs> no, I just gotta kind of acknowledge the smile there. Um, but Balagas, uh, in case you don't know who he is, uh, he is uh, the guy that uh, pulled it out of the hat last time, uh, part of a team there. Uh, and, and I can't give him complete credit, but he, he's uh, one of the guys that is cutthroat. And um, I know Selinger was uncomfortable with some of, uh, of his strategy, um, but it worked. And I think sometimes the ability, and again, I'll go back to, to giving Gary Dewar and, and the, that team there all sorts of credit, is that their ability to plant seeds two years in Hansard, uh, so that two years later they can go back and say, you know, uh, you said this back in, 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 in 2009. No, I didn't. Yes, it's right here. And, and that is brilliant. And I remember uh, a staffer asking, I just wanted to be sure of uh, something that you had on your show two years ago. Yeah, like I remember. But that's how good record keeping, and, and that still is in place. But sometimes I think uh, the Premier doesn't have that killer instinct uh, to be able to do that. And I think sometimes he, he just doesn't want to do it, and yeah, okay, I'll do it. Um, because I agree with you with Nancy Allen, but Nancy Allen was done from cabinet. Yep. And the, it was anticipated that there would be other retirements, but it ended up that she was pretty well the only front bench that, that left. So as a result, what sort of signal does that send? Um, so yeah, maybe, like you said, a lot of missed opportunities there. Well, I, I think Selinger too, my impression of him with caucus is that he's not as heavy handed as Gary Durer was. The, the caucus discipline is not quite uh, as unified as it was uh, under Durer. Um, Balagas uh, ruled things with an iron fist, according to everybody I've talked to. And what's very telling is that just months after Balagas left, um, things came off the wheels for the NDP with the free NHL Jets tickets policy. I think under Balagas that would have been a one-day story put to bed very quickly. Caucus would have been brought in, everybody would have done a mea culpa, released to the media by Tuesday afternoon, the story's over. Instead, we got five days where things were coming out in dribs and drabs about who got free NHL tickets, who didn't, who said they didn't. Take the band-aid off and rip it off. Don't take it off slowly. And the Melnick matter also happened in that same time. This is mere months after Balagas is gone. You've got um, a minister who uh, used bureaucrats to invite people, publicly funded people, to come down to the legislature for a political show of support. And for months and months and months, there was controversy over whose idea was this, was the Premier involved? Um, we're still 18 months later at this juncture where the, the Premier uh, says he and his staff were not involved in the decision to use bureaucrats. And a former minister, 
directly contradicts him and says, no, his staff was involved and she was made to take the fall. So we're still at this juncture, all this time later, where either the premier is not telling the truth or a minister who spent 10 years in cabinet is not telling the truth. And whichever one is not telling the truth has not been telling the truth for a very long time. Once again, once again, I have a question, but I will discipline myself for the sake of time and move on. Next one, biggest story that we, you the journalists, didn't uh, cover this year. What's the biggest story that didn't get enough attention that it deserved? Take it away. Sure. The oil patch. We do not write anything about the really now quite massive, okay, massive is too strong a word. I'm an Albertan, I should know better. It's not massive, but it is now bigger than uh, the mining industry, which gets way more press. Um, we have, we're, we're, we're fracking at really remarkable rates. Um, the oil patch is growing like by 20% a year, um, barrel-wise. The, the revenue is, is astronomical. We consider ourselves a green enviro, green power province, um, you know, that almost met its Kyoto targets, and yet we are massively expanding the oil patch. And maybe because it's, you know, in southwestern Manitoba, nobody sees it, barely, um, except the Brandon Sun, we don't write about it. And, you know, we did a few stories last year. Um, we should do way more. I think it is a map, it, it's essentially a debate we have not had in this province. Um, and it's, a, it's an industry that is, is at odds with many of our policies, and we're not talking about it. That's my, my untold story. Um, I probably have about 30 or 40 stories on that list simply because there's never enough time in this business. Um, this touches on provincial jurisdiction because they've done a lot of things behind the scenes um, at Child and Family Services and at Manitoba Justice, um, and there's still a lot more work to, to be done. Um, but, uh, and, and this is the policy wonk guy talking here, um, there is a, a real coordinative, uh, there's, there's, there, departments are talking to each other in a way that now is focused on problem solving on, on some of the chronic uh, crime and child and family service issues in Winnipeg's inner city. Uh, not too far away from here, you know, you can name about six or seven families where there have been problems continually um, with contact with child and family services and then they graduate into the criminal justice system. And there is a group of people uh, from the Winnipeg Police Service and, and justice officials that have been working behind the scenes very quietly the last several years and, and part of it is coming through block by block and, 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 and what they're trying to do uh, in essentially door knocking and saying to families, do you need help and this is how we can, we can do it. There's not a lot of political credit or capital on this, but uh, they're funded, they're doing the right thing, and it's making a difference. Um, it's making a difference on the ground now, but hopefully five and 10 and 15 years from now it will. Um, we did a good job when auto theft got under control because we could, we could see it, right? The, 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 the line between the immobilizer and reduced auto theft rates and, and keeping an eye on the, through the Watts program on the top 50 and then the top 100 uh, youth criminals. This is far more intricate uh, and I know at the cabinet table uh, it's, uh, it's, got, uh, it's got support. And, um, you know, I give credit to any government that's tackling some of these bigger, bigger problems that, you know, that don't get the gotcha stuff that we do on an ongoing basis. So that's kind of the biggest story that we, and, and there's still an opportunity to cover it. It's a tough story to cover, but I'll tell you, it's going on and, and it's moving the needle. I, I'm just going to agree with Mary Agnes. I mean, I, I think a lot of Manitobans aren't even aware that there's fracking in Manitoba. And as opposition to fracking grows. Uh, we've seen in the US now government agencies saying, hmm, this seems to be linked to increased earthquakes, and, let alone the other environmental uh, damage that, that it's caused. Uh, as opposition to fracking grows, this will become more of an issue. It also ties into hydro's expansion plans, because part of the reason hydro 
uh, prices are low is because it's competing against cheap uh, other forms of energy that are uh, made cheap by fracking. So does this get back to the fact that the major oil firm is owned by the Richardson family? And nobody wants to alienate the Richardsons, including the publisher of the Winnipeg Free Press and the owner? No? I, don't, I, didn't even, I guess I didn't really realize that. No. No, okay. It's, it's, it's because it's there's not enough time. Perimeter. It's outside the perimeter. There's not, yeah. not enough time. Yeah, the main reason is it's outside the perimeter. It's private companies who are sometimes jerks to deal with. It's, um, although oddly enough, there's a tremendous amount of information on the province's website. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just... It's like a did you know kind of a story that has not translated into a holy shit kind of a story for some reason. But, but to be fair, um, what, what's happening is south of the border in North Dakota, it's exploded, right? Yeah. Here, um, we've said we're going to allow for that slow growth to go on. Um, and there have been moves to try to really uh, do a lot more drilling in, in southwestern Manitoba and the deal that I'm told has been struck is we're going to have this, this this slow progress, but yeah, we should spend more time out in Verdi for sure. <laughs> okay. So we'll go to the uh, sorry. We'll go to the last uh, the last question. Here's what we've all been uh, waiting for: the funniest story or the best backroom gossip story. We keep getting these references to these gossipy stories that are being put off, and finally we're here. We get to hear them. So uh, take it away. Um, there's a few, but this is going on YouTube, so I'll, I'll limit myself to one. Um, the infidel atheist incident that we're all familiar with. This started out as somebody's good idea. Um, uh, this was uh, somebody, a, a non-journalist, a, a local uh, blogger, who has a YouTube channel, uh, Natalie Pollock, you probably know. Um, she was uh, she had asked to come down and talk to Brian Pallister, and uh, the Tories for a while, uh, their media people were saying, well, let's open up to uh, all types of non-traditional media. So she was invited to come uh, talk to Mr. Pallister. Um, the idea was that she would not be uh, able to discuss policy or ask serious questions, but for a, a, just a nice, light, Merry Christmas message, what could go wrong? Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> so, uh, Brian Pallister's in the hallway, and the softball is thrown at him, and he starts on his little twisted logic thing here, making a joke. The infill atheist comes out, and if you watch the video, you can see the lights go on, the wheels start trimming, he realizes he's made a mistake, and there are two or three new Democrats around, <laughs> and uh, the public may not know this, but in the hallway, it's sort of a turkey shoot. Um, each political party is monitoring what People from the other party say they record scrums of the other party. So New Democrats are recording this whole infidel atheist thing, and they realize they've just struck gold. So he starts trying to walk back from it and go, and whether you're of this religion or that religion, and I support your right, and, and it just goes on, and it gets a bit painful. But that's the genesis of that, uh, of that infamous moment. Now, of course, he said it wasn't a joke, that he meant it sincerely. Yes, yeah, I, I think that's where he ended up with something <laughs> All right. Uh, my story's not exactly funny. I was trying to figure out what story to tell, because most of my stories involve me being slightly mean to a cabinet minister, and I don't really want to do that. Um, although, actually, this isn't going to be all that flattering. So, um, we talked a bit about Kevin Chief today. And one of the most interesting things I did last year was go to uh, Fisher, Fisher River First Nation, Fisher, Fisher River First Nation, with Kevin Chief and uh, Mark Chipman, who I'd never met, don't know anything about hockey, couldn't pick the, I could pick the guy in the lineup because he's pretty famous, but don't know anything about hockey at all. And so Kevin Chief and Mark Chipman went to this powwow um, in Fisher River because the uh, Jets had funded um, some youth programs there. And I was actually on the reserve for another story and got totally hijacked by all the cabinet communications people who knew I was going to be there and said, oh, you should go cover Kevin Chief and Mark Chipman. And I swear to God, if I see Kevin Chief's photo in our paper one more time, I'm going to cry because he is at every, he was at an event today. He is everywhere. The NDP puts him up at every press event ever. And sure enough, he was in, in Fisher River. Um, so, but it was very, I found it, I 
uh, Kevin ran really quite a remarkable campaign in Point Douglas when he, and he won, quite innovative, and he really is an articulate um, guy who really, behind the scenes, you hear that he really does kind of form a bridge between the city and the province where there never was one before. He's a pretty conciliatory, everybody relax, let's work this out kind of a guy, which is what is needed. But I was really struck in Fisher River by how, in the end, how little he actually had to say. And we had long conversations about life on reserve and Aboriginal youth and what's needed to get kids in, edu in you know, in school. And and he's, I, I, I was surprised at the end of the day when I looked through my notes and realized he hadn't said anything of substance, and that I didn't really have a a good quote, because it was all talking points of the very best kind, really high quality talking points that you don't realize are talking points until the end of the day. And that really stood in contrast to Mark Chipman, who I was kind of nervous to meet, I didn't know what to expect, and he was, and maybe businessmen are just like this com compared to politicians, but he was extremely um, humble, and, and, but, and knowledgeable, and, and uh, curious and well-spoken and genuine. And he was the big star of this powwow. Like, you'd walk through the crowd with him and people would say, oh, there goes the billionaire, Mark Chapman. And, you know, like, <laughs> and, like he really was a star. And kind of in his nerdy, you know, uh, um, kind of K-way on, he was kind of, you know, comfortable and like the white guy at the powwow. But he was really remarkable. <laughs> and and so, 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 so ever since then, I have had, you just hear nothing but um, a lot of people blowing smoke up Kevin Chief's ass. Like it's just, he's just the man. He is, you know, the next generation. He's amazing. And I have come to take that, because of that experience on, on the reserve, I've come to take that with a grain of salt. Because I, I haven't seen it yet, I guess, in, in real life. So that's not a funny and or gossipy story, but it was a really, it was a moment where I, my perception changed radically about a, really the rising star in the party. I'll end with some fun. Oh, good. <laughs> um, doing what I'm doing now, uh, I interview the Premier and he's on tomorrow morning at 7.45. And uh, he's, he's, he's fun to interview because he's a really nervous guy. And he doesn't want to, he wants, he wants to stick to the talking points. Uh, and he wants to be your best friend. And, and, and off air, I like the guy. He's, he's, he's very engaging. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. Uh, he's, he's a policy guy. He, he, he knows his stuff. But when it comes to communications, he's still not completely comfortable in his skin. So uh, in radio, like in television, uh, on um, the outside of every door, uh, studio door, there's a red light that says on air. And when it's not lit, the microphone's not on. Uh, when it is lit, the microphone is on. <laughs> Greg Selinger can't understand the difference between when the light is on and when the light is off. <laughs> so the first time he came in uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we're doing traffic and weather together on the ones again on CJOB, and all of a sudden, good morning! <laughs> it's Uncle Greg. <laughs> and, and he starts, we have um, about six or seven chairs in our main studio. And uh, every week, Without a doubt, he tries kind of like Goldilocks each chair <laughs> to see whether or not it's comfortable or whatever the height. And I say to him off here, you can adjust the, the chairs. I don't like this chair. And he's just fidgety like this. And then finally, uh, when we go on, he kind of gets it together. But I have to kind of illustrate this way. This is going on YouTube, by the way. <laughs> so our microphones hang like this. So they're unidirectional, so you have to talk like this microphone right into the microphone. Well, Selinger will get fired up, and then he'll start talking like this. <laughs> and then I'm here, he played the role, and I'm going like this. 
meaning talk right into the microphone. And he, so, so listen tomorrow morning <laughs> at 7.45. Start listening about 7.40 for the good morning! <laughs> and then we'll start asking the questions and I'll, I'll purposely get him fired up on something. And then you'll hear him like this off mic. And then coming back like this. And then going off like this. And it's those little things that, that I find that add up. Because, you know, again, he knows his stuff, but it's communications 101. You know, how to use the mic, how to do these things, etc. cetera. And, and, it's, and it's fun in that way. Um, but it can be a real pain in the ass. Um, the other stories are, um, you know, I, I think maybe uh, the, the Kevin Chief uh, impression that you have might be an interesting one simply because of, uh, of somebody who's kind of grown up in, in Winnipeg, maybe not very comfortable on the reserve, um, which, which might explain that, um, but also a compliment to, to the handlers as far as his ability to stick to the talking points, right? Um, because I find that uh, a, in the next year, I'll be very interested to see whether Chiefs still continues to rise and, and, and where Howard lands in all this. All right. Well, the premier comes across as positively endearing after that. Yeah. Oh, he's, 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 he's funny in a goofy way that way. But it's just kind of like, ah! and I'm going to go through the same thing tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>